Yeah. Join us, friends. Great Scott, Spock guy. Do they know what we have in store for them? They will if they tighten up. And don't double dribble. To the Grey Ghost, Spock guy? Exactly, old chum. No time to waste. To the Grey Ghost. We have not a minute to spare. It's showtime, friends. All right, all right, all right, Trey. So <laughs> let's try it again. We had a little glitch before. I see you had a little glitch with the uh, with the basketball. And I am the Spock guy, and this is... I'm globe trotting with Trey. And we are not wishing Cotton was a monkey, but we know that there are a lot of people that do. Friends, don't wish Cotton was a monkey. It's a bad idea. But sadly, it seems to be the way of the world. So today, we're going to bring our good friend Rob Moss in, and we're going to talk about all kinds of different stuff. So don't miss this. So let's bring Rob in. We're going to go to that, and then I'm going to go to this. Rob Moss, what's going on, my friend? Hello, gentlemen. How are you? Oh, good, we Rob. are doing fantastic. Are you, you doing all right? I'm doing fantastic for a uh, full-figured white man. Yeah, man, I am as well. So let's talk about uh, several different things. First, let's go back to uh, you friends with Bill Stovall. We've established that. And I, I, Bill and I were friends uh, way back, high school friends. And right. still friends today. And uh, so you came, Bill's son, Will Stovall, actually has a new album out. And Will wrote a lot of songs. And Bill's dream was to go record at uh, what is now called Sun Studios. When Elvis recorded there, it was not Sun Studios. It would have been Memphis Recording Service. And it would have been Sun Records. And what happened is Sun Records got sold to Shelby Singleton by Sam Phillips. So when they got this building and decided to turn it into a museum, they couldn't call it Sun Records because someone owned that. Nobody knows what Memphis Recording Service is, so they went with Sun Studios. And it is, in fact, an active recording studio. So you were present when uh, Bill Stovall and Will Stovall were nice enough to ask me to come record with them. And so tell us uh, what you recall from that, and did you have a good time when that happened? I had a phenomenal time. It was, it was spiritual. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you this, I had a really hard time talking about it when I came back from the trip because I, I couldn't convey how important it was for me to, to be a part of that um, the properly. So I really just kept it to myself. I told my brother and my, my girlfriend, but I really, it was just, it was, it was really personal to me, which is weird because any other time I would have been bragging to everybody what I got to do, you know? Um, but, the, you know, Bill invited me. His son was turning 21, and I, it gave me an opportunity to meet you. Uh, and one of the first impressions of you I had was you are a full-fledged, no no doubt about it, musician. Because the the guy in the studio was saying, okay, well, six on the on the take back of the, of the – just language, just total language. And you were just communicating with him just like it's what you do. You got up and played the piano a little bit. You played the bass. I mean, it was, I was really impressed with the fact that you could hold your own. So then Bill told me, he says, oh, yeah, Billy's recorded. He's a record, recorded artist. He's recorded gospel albums. Um, you shared with me not too long ago that you, uh, the, the, the Jordanaires thing. Can you, can, you, can you tell me about that real quick? Or uh, tell, tell me what I told you. <laughs> well, that you, that you could sing J.D. Summers part if you wanted oh, to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You were saying, yeah, I actually got invited to audition for the Blackwood Brothers. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, and uh, for, it's called, it's not called, it's called the, the Fabulous Blackwood Brothers. It's not the Blackwood Brothers Quartet. It's another one of the Blackwoods, but they asked me to audition to be the bass singer. My issue is, is man, I just don't have time. I would love to do that. I would love to sing with the quartet and go out. But but those guys literally, they are on the road all the time. And I right. just don't have, I don't have the kind of time to, to devote to that. Um, but that would be a dream come true to come to, to do that. And, and I've played in a lot of bands. You know, I started, my very first band, I started, uh, I was 15 years old. And Bill tells this story where, I told him at, at high school, I said, you know, I play in a band. And he thought, right. right. And uh, and he figured out that, no, I really did play in a band. But at the time, 
I was 15, 16 years old. I couldn't get in the bars that we were playing legally. So my parents would actually sign permission slips for me to give to the local in North Carolina. They call them alcohol is ABC. What does that stand for? Um, alcohol beverage control or so I can't remember, but yeah. it's called the ABC stores. Right. All the, all the liquor stores in North Carolina are owned by the state and they have ABC officers for each County. So what we would have to do is when we went into a County to play in that bar, if you will, club, we would have to contact the local ABC officer and I would have to present him with my permission slip from my parents. And the way it would work is I could go in and set my drums up. I could, uh, uh, you sound check. And anytime I was not physically playing the drums, I had to be outside of the building. I got you. I would have to, after the set, I'd have to go outside and wait till it was time to play the next set. But I played in that band. And a lot of those guys are still playing music today. Uh, a good friend of mine, Ross Rhodes lives in Kinston, you know, North Carolina. And he plays with a band called, uh, heck I'm, I'm going to embarrass myself because I'm not going to say it right. So I'm going to look it up. Uh, but they're actively playing right now. And there's actually a, a young lady that plays bass in that band that I played with in another band. So, and Billy, you, you're telling band, me? Tell me again. You're telling me that you didn't make a fake ID back then? No. <laughs> Gunpowder <laughs> and Lead Band is the name of the band. And it's uh, Ross Rhodes and and Diane that I played in bands with. There's several guys got to, uh, girls got together and formed a band, but I played in bands with, with all those guys. Um, and so a lot of people that I play with, and what's funny is I'll, I'll share this part of the story, which I, I, looking back, I find it very, very interesting. Um, we lived in, uh, we were not rich by any stretch, but my dad did, did well. Okay. So we lived in a four bedroom house, two bath, nice neighborhood, in ground swimming pool, we were what I would consider what we would, I would call middle class. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the people that I played with in the band, some of them were not. Okay. So they, they considered me to be the rich guy that played in the band. Okay. As crazy as that sounds. <laughs> and I didn't have a pot to pee in a window to throw it out of, you know, just because my father had money and we lived in a nice home didn't mean I had money. Okay? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, when I was playing the drums, the way I got those drums is my grandma. Uh, this actually happened in Aden, North Carolina. It was I did a video where I show you where the auction house is in Aden. It was right across the street from Starlight Barbecue, which is a famous barbecue place in Aden. That is the top of it looks like the Capitol in Washington, yes. D.C., because they're famous for presidents getting barbecue from there. Right. And uh, their last name is... Um, Oh, uh, what is the guy? What's the new barbecue place in Greenville? There's one in, in Raleigh now. Um, Sam Jones. That's Sam Jones's grandfather that owns the barbecue place. And Sam Jones, the grandson, has Sam Jones barbecue. There's one in Raleigh, one in okay. Greenville. Really, really good North Carolina barbecue. And guys, if you're not from North Carolina and you don't know what North Carolina barbecue is, you're really missing out. I live in, in Tennessee. And I hear about Memphis barbecue and all that, and it does not hold a candle to North Carolina barbecue <laughs> to me. In right. fact, when I went to uh, – you helped me get my car, Rob, uh, in Statesville, North Carolina, and you took me to a North Carolina-style barbecue place. What was the name of that? Lancaster's. Lancaster's. And so you actually took me there because I told you that I love that kind of barbecue, and you went, hey, I know the place. Right. And you were right. It was really, 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 really good. So, but anyway, we played music and to tell you how poor these guys were at the time, I was an Elvis fan. Okay. So I lived, I listened to Elvis. I learned to play the drums on the Bee Gees. So when the Bee Gees album came out for Saturday Night Fever, that's, I had a drum set that my grandma bought from this auction house in Aiden. It was called Buck's Auction House. She paid $24 for them. It was an E.W. Kent set. They were orange sparkle. And I had a blue sparkle snare drum because the Kent set snare drum was messed up. So my, my drums were $24 and I got my cymbals and my drummers thrown in my hi-hat for Christmas from out of the JC Penny catalog. Oh, wow. And so that's how I got all of my, my, my cymbals and all that. 
And my cymbals were so thin, I would hit them and they would turn inside out. My hi hat would literally <laughs> flip, but I'd have to pop it off and pop it back. That's uh -uh. how thin they were. Oh so, my God. Trey, this is, this is back in the day when, when Rob and I were kids, it was a big deal to get stuff out of the JC Penny catalog. Did you get stuff for Christmas out of the Penny's catalog? I did too. I did too. My yeah. Symbols of stuff came out of the Penny's catalog, and my first bass guitar came out of this, the JC Penny's catalog. So, so, so anyway, your, your grandparents would actually have to cut a coupon out and mail it in to buy this stuff. Is that what happened? No, you would order it. Uh, you would go order it or order it mail order. But they would have to mail. They would have to mail order, or they could call. I guess. I think you could probably call and buy it with a credit card over the phone. Maybe by the yeah. end. Yeah, maybe I don't. I mean, I don't remember credit cards even being. A I big don't think deal. so. I think y'all had to. They had to mail stuff to buy. Yeah, right. You had to go to the store and pick it up. You had to go to the store and pick up whatever yeah. you ordered. Yeah, you the time. Would have it sent to the store and yeah. then go pick it up. Yeah, right. and see, yeah. those guys went away. Sears went away, and J.C. Penney's went away because they stayed with their old moat program when e-commerce took off. They should have jumped on the e-commerce bandwagon, and they didn't, and it ate yeah. their lunch. Right. So that's why, you know, as as resistant as I want to be as a business owner to change, I realize that I have to. And uh, and I went I started selling on Amazon because um, I was selling on eBay. I've been selling on eBay for heck, what's this 20, uh, for 24 years. I've been selling on eBay in some form or another uh, back in 19 in. In uh, 1999, I was selling Scotty Moore autograph stuff. <laughs> right. You know, that's how I started, you know. And uh, but over the years, I've sold all kinds of stuff. I started selling spa parts and I had someone and I don't even know who to credit this with. But I had someone say, hey, man, you got to start selling on Amazon. And I went, I don't want to sell on Amazon. What are you talking about? No. And I was resistant to it. But then that person just kept after me until I said, OK, I'm going to check into it. So I started checking into it and and started selling on Amazon. And it turns out they were right. As my eBay sales was dropping, my Amazon sales passed it going the other way. So there was a time when eBay was my number one sales way of hot tub parts online. Then Amazon overtook that. And then my own personal websites overtook that, overtook Amazon. So now Amazon's two. eBay's three. Amazon's two. My personal websites are number one. Gotcha. But but it was because I was listening, you know, trying to stay up with the times. And that's a, a complete aside to what we're even talking about. But in this particular episode, friends, we're just going to talk. Is that cool, Rob? That's we're cool to me, man. About stuff, Trey. And hey, um, so I'm kind of reminiscing about this. But anyway, to tell you, I learned to play the drums listening to the Saturday Night Fever soundtrack. On playing it on my record player and playing the drums to the soundtrack. That's true. Um, and I also was an Elvis fan prior to that, but Bee Gees were big at that time. And it's real straightforward disco type beats. So learning those beats was the way that I honed my drumming skills, if you will. So right. I didn't listen to rock and roll. Okay. So think about this. I got hired as the drummer in a rock and roll band to play songs I'd never heard. Okay. So I'm in this rock and roll band and they're going, okay, well, we're going to play Freebird. And the way the drums are is it's, you know, we're going to start like this. It is a dun, chick, dun. They're going to go boom, chick, boom, pajana, boom, chick, boom, pajana. They were so poor. They didn't have records. They didn't have a tape player. They didn't have any way of letting me listen to these songs. They would just go, it goes like this. That's a fact. I played in that band never hearing those songs. Now, wow. of course, now I know the songs, but I played the very first song that I ever sang in a rock and roll band was a Foghat song called um, uh, Long, Long Way From Home. Um, and it had a drum intro. It had a vocal intro. Uh, da, 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 no drums yet. Da, 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 I don't remember the words, but it was like the, the kick drum would go boop, 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 in certain parts of the intro, and then it would kick off. But they would have to to tell me how the songs went. Like we played Led Zeppelin songs. I'd never heard it. I didn't know what they were talking about. And so that was how poor they were. And I hate to bring this up, but this is the reality of it. And I guess I shouldn't mention names in here. I've already mentioned some names. But these guys like to 
smoke a little wacky weed. You know, they like to take a little bit of the king's grass, you know, the, the long yeah. leaf hole, the uh the devil's lettuce, you know. <laughs> the they devil's lettuce. <laughs> um, I did not partake of any I've never smoked marijuana ever. But these bands that I played in, I could have I could have uh smoked enough marijuana to fill a transfer truck for free. <laughs> you know, I could have stored a line of cocaine from here to downtown Nashville. Yep. That's a fact. And uh but it was just it was prevalent. I was playing. It was in the in the late seventies, early eighties. It was prevalent. Everybody um, was doing it then, and everybody was doing it. But these people in their home, they didn't have really any amenity. I don't even think they even had a. If they had a telephone, I don't remember it. You know, as crazy as that sounds, but they would anyway. My whole point to this is. I had no reference to these songs that I was playing in this band. I just played. And so when we played out, people would tell me, wow, man, that was a, that's an interesting take on that song. I, I wasn't, I wasn't imitating what they were doing. I was doing me yeah. playing the song, you know, yeah, that's and, great. Uh, but we played a lot And those guys. They were a lot older than me as well. And what I'm saying, I was 15 or 16. I'm going to say the next closest to me in the band was probably 20 or 21 or 30. And we had two lead singers. We had a bass player. I played drums. We had three guitar players. Um, and it was loud and proud, you know. And um, I, I just, I have all these memories of it, of them doing this. I remember them showing me this thing that was a, uh, it looked like a piece of tinfoil. And I was like, well, what is that? And he said, it's, this is blotter acid. And he stuck it on his tongue. And they dissolve it on their tongue, and it was acid, you know. And uh, also have this recollection of being at this guy's house. Do what? Never done that. Yeah. Well, see, they were tripping on this playing, you know, mm. while we're playing. <laughs> and look, I could tell you, they called me Two Beer Billy, and this was later. I wasn't old enough to drink at the time, but when I was of age and could drink, after two beers, I could no longer play my guitar. You know, when I was playing, I can't. Two beers and I'm done. I can't play an instrument. So I had to not drink when I was playing in the bands. All two of Two beers, so, Billy. Okay. Two beers, Billy. That's a fact. And <laughs> so when I was playing in the bands, I had to be in a position where I couldn't, where I did not drink. But most of the people in the band were high on drugs or drinking. So it was very surreal for me to, to deal with these people right. and them in those states. But uh, I remember being at... Um, I'm not going to say his last name, but the guy's house that we practice at, his, his first name's Lonnie, still plays music. And he ended up going on to be in, uh, in to do some things with some big bands like Molly Hatchet and some bands like that. He was with some of those guys playing music, you know. And um, But I, I think the world with Lonnie, he's, he's still alive. But we were in his kitchen, and it wasn't Lonnie. It was a guy that was there because you had some, some hangers on. You know, there was people that would just come to hear the music and hang around and do drugs. So we're in the kitchen at this house, and it was a shotgun house where the uh, the front door, there was a hallway that went to the back door. And then there was a room here and a room there and a room here and a room there. And it seemed like there was a bathroom. But that's, and I remember the kitchen being, if you came in the back door, it had been the room on the right. And so we were in that room, and the guy had a uh, a, a, a saucer like a cup saucer upside down with a clear cup on the top. And it, he had hash in there and he would light the hash and it would smoke up inside the cup and he'd take a straw and suck the smoke out. And I saw this dude fall out on the floor and just pass out from that. And I thought that dude's going to die. <laughs> the cops are going to come and I'm going to go to jail and I'm not doing drugs. So, you know, I had to really rethink what I was even doing there. Yeah. But um, there was a great bunch of guys, and I, I know most of them today, and they're all off of drugs, not doing any of that stuff. That was a wild time back then. Uh, but I, that was a complete aside, guys. I'm sorry. I was just reminiscing in my head about playing music. But that's where I started with that band. And Two I went beers. on to play a do what? <laughs> Two beers, Billy. I love Two it. beer, Billy. That's that's Two a fact. So do, I went do you on have to play. Tape? Billy, do you have a cassette or something of of any of that music at all? 
Um, not, not way, way back, not back then. And I shouldn't say that we recorded, uh, we recorded two songs. I'll never forget. This is a funny story. One of the songs was written by a guy named, uh, there was our guitar player's name was Billy White. And, uh, and he wrote a song and I remember recording and I was so proud of the recording and I went and let my dad hear it. And one of the lines in the song was talking about snorting snow. And my dad looked at me and said, what did he just say? And I said, I, I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I can, I'll never forget my dad going, did he just say snorting snow? What is, what, you know, and he was talking about snorting, mar- snorting cocaine, you know? And, uh, but anyway, so later I ended up playing, um, bass in a rock band actually i played guitar and sang in the band and our bass player is a guy named luke langley moved to chicago and uh luke was a really really good bass player that could play anything and he was a big rush fan big getty lee fan and when he moved our band was doing we were doing van halen and stuff like that and rush we were doing that kind of rock and roll by that time i had learned some rock and roll you know and i was very familiar a uh, huge Rush fan, huge uh, uh, Van Halen fan. And so our bass player moved. We had, didn't have a bass player, so I moved to bass. And then we started doing only Rush. So I was actually Getty in a Rush cover band. And the uh, the name of our band was Us, like Rush, but Us, just U.S. in the middle of Rush. And That's it was funny. me and a guy named Lee Hill that still plays guitar and a guy named Russell Brown. Uh, that played drums and they were much, they were several years younger than me and they were from rich families. And so we practiced at uh, one of their, at Lee Hill's house. His dad was the, the local um, uh, uh, veterinarian, big veterinarian hospital in Kinston, North Carolina. And uh, so we would play at Lee's house and we ended up being a, we only did rush. So I had the, uh, the, the Taurus uh, Moog pedals that I played with my feet and the keyboard and the bass. I still have my Rickenbacker bass. Oh, wow. I en- ended up having a, I still have my Rickenbacker that I bought in 19, I bought that bass in 1984 and I still wow. have it. Still have the receipt from where I bought it. Wow. Um, it's a blue 4001, the real Rickenbacker, the original right. 4001 uh, that has the stereo. You know, you can plug two amps into it. It's got two, two out, two, two uh, quarter inch outputs. But anyway, we played uh, Rush in those bands. Uh, and then I ended up playing, uh, What in, I actually had this conversation with someone the other day. What ended up happening was by the late eighties, all of the rock and roll clubs had gone away and they turned into country clubs. And I don't mean golf country clubs, I'm talking about country music. That was when Garth, Garth kind of turned all that around in about 88 or 89. So that's when all that kind of changed and all these country clubs started up. So I had to switch from rock and roll to country to have somewhere to play. So I did. I became, uh, I ended up being a lead singer in a country band. Um, and uh, up until I moved moved to Nashville in 1999. And I played up until uh, late 98, I played with a band, a bunch of great guys out of uh, Benson, <laughs> Uh, North Carolina, that area over there. And all those guys still play music. I'm about the only one, I think, that's not not actively playing in a band from all those guys. Most of them still play. Um, I just don't have time. But I did uh, play with them. But I was a lead singer in that band. They hired me to, to be their lead singer. They were a bunch of great guys, great musicians. And we played a lot there. We played over 100 dates a year. Um wow. And I was working full time and all that. So it was quite a challenge to do that. But then I wanted to move to Nashville to be a country music singer. Of course, you know, that never happened. Uh, Well, I moved here and ended up having to figure out a way to make a living, you know, and I opened the business when I came here, but it didn't immediately take off. So there was some, you know, your, the struggles you mentioned uh, in another episode where we were talking about you trying to get into NASCAR, I went in moving to Nashville. You know, right. we went through some financial things that I'd never been through before, uh, just simply by changing jobs and changing venues and trying to open a business. Now I'm way on the other side of that and uh, and very, very, very fortunate. But 
trying to pursue that dream, I ended up doing some, you know, going through some really, really rough times. Yeah. Financially, especially. But, uh, which was tougher, the financial aspects or trying to sound like Getty Lee? Uh, <laughs> well, I can actually sound like Getty Lee, believe That's it or not. cool, yeah. for real? Yeah, and I don't know if I could hit all those high notes now, but I could, yeah. Wow. Yeah. You just get get in that in that voice. You go, living on a lighted stage approaches the unreal. Dang, all right. You just do that, that little thing. Yeah, all right. Uh, so... Um, but yeah, I, I did that for a long time and it was a hey, lot of fun. Hey, that's Rob, cool. yeah. have you ever seen a, you know, you, y'all think about, I have the hair. Have you ever seen the photos of Billy back in the day with his hairstyle? No, I haven't. He was a rock star. Have you ever yeah, seen these well, I, had the, <laughs> I could pull those pictures up. I had a mullet and this is a podcast, but, yeah. but, um, but yeah, I was, I had quite the mullet back then. And, uh, wow. of course, back then I actually had hair. So Billy goes from trying to be a rock star, country singer to a YouTube star. How did that happen? Well, I don't know about it being a YouTube star, but but I don't this know. Is Billy, you're about, you're about at a hundred thousand subscribers. I would say that's something. Yes, yes. Yeah, I got yes. a few subscribers, but the uh, the the thing I would <clears> say about that is, I get a lot more fulfillment, and I don't know how this this ended up turning to be about me because that's not what this was. This podcast was supposed to be about. Uh, and it won't continue, friends. So we're gonna we're gonna get off of this and and move to something else. But I'll find some pictures here and show you. Real I love hearing about you and Trey. I love hearing y'all stories, man. Yeah. And uh, but what ended up happening is um, the uh, you, you and when you were playing in those country clubs, you know, I had the Garth Brooks microphone and the whole nine yards. <laughs> you know, you had to have that. I still had that microphone, by the way. It was yeah, a cold rain. The skull ring in the blue jeans. Tell me again. Yeah, the skull ring in the blue jeans. Skull the skull, ring. The skull ring. The the, the oh, outline. No, no, I didn't do that. Now that's that's not so much Garth. That would be more. Um, uh, what's the other guy? Um, the rodeo guy. I don't know why I'm having so much trouble finding these pictures. Rodeo Maybe guy. No, the rodeo guy, the guy that plays the songs, all the rodeo related guys. He's a little more laid back, very, very famous country singer. And I would call him a rodeo singer. Alan Jackson? No, but Alan Jackson's a good, a good, this guy's bigger than Alan Jackson. George, George Strait. George, George Strait. Yes, yeah. George Strait. I would call a rodeo guy. But now the, the, uh, the Wranglers. With the skull in the back, that's your straight. That's not that's not Garth Brooks. I got you. Okay, in my opinion, what I like about a uh, uh, Garth Brooks is when you know I, I watched that documentary on him. They raised funds for him to go to Nashville to try to make it as a singer, and he lasted what a day and a half in Nashville and got back in his car and went back home. Yeah. That's crazy. I that was awesome, that. You know, yeah, <laughs> like, I ain't doing this. He went back home. And show back up to that club, and everybody. This was like, is oh. not what I was going to show you, but that's an example of that's Ross Rhodes here. This is a guy I played in with the first band. I'm playing guitar and singing in this band. Oh wow! And I think that this is this may not be the night, but this band we opened for McBride and the Ride, and boy, I thought we had arrived. Yeah, and we were able to open for McBride and the Ride. I still love they. They've actually just. Uh, started back up again, uh, Terry McBride and those hey, guys. And, and the fans that are listening to this and you're trying to figure out what we're talking about, you'll have to go to our YouTube show and watch us actually on screen to show. Yeah, the if you want to see the visuals of this, as I mentioned, this is really supposed to be a podcast, but... Um, yeah, but yeah, but Rob, he did. He uh, uh, supposedly, Garth Brooks came to town to Nashville. He met with some kind of executive they didn't really do or they didn't really like sign him or anything. And he kind of got discouraged and was like, you know, I'm not doing this and got in his car and went back home. Well, where wow. Garth was, he was a big That's deal. Crazy. And what I mean is he was selling out stuff everywhere he went. And when he came here, I think they treated him like he needed to start over. 
but he didn't. He already had a following. So this was early because, you know, he was singing in like some clubs and stuff at this point because yeah. they raised money. out That one club that he, he was performing in a lot, they pooled their money together and, and sent him to Nashville. Wow. To try, yeah. try to make it. So it could have been before all that. Well, do you remember I did a story with the Elvis thing um, in outside of Texarkana. You remember – I was trying to find the uh, the what was that club called? It was the it was a place that Elvis had played that they thought it was the like the owl. It was something to do with outbuilding or a storage building or something of that nature. This is me, by the way, at thirteen years old, twelve years old. That's me in my Elvis outfit. Hey man, I like that. Yeah, <laughs> and pretty uh, cool. I wanted to be Elvis. Spy guy had a Elvis jumpsuit. Yeah, I sure did. Man, that's pretty cool right there. Did you did you buy that or did someone make it for you? I had it made. Bet Taylor made it in Kinston, North Carolina. All right. She was our next door neighbor and she worked at Presley Cleaners. Presley. And uh and it's Presley with two S's, and that's Jamie Presley, the movie star. That's okay. her family from oh, Kinston. okay. Yep, Jamie Presley. Hey, I bet you were excited, Billy, when you saw oh, that. Oh man, and and look. You know how you grow when you're 12 or 13 years old? You have that growth spurt. It was no time before I didn't fit that thing anymore. Man. Uh, you know, and I got it for Christmas, and they were making it for me. And you're talking about excited. I <laughs> bet. I could not believe it. We know why Billy wore a Christmas Day that year. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> old, that's at Christmas, that photo I just showed you. Uh, I know it was. I know it was. So, Rob, you, you, have, you, Rob, you met Billy at, at, at uh, Memphis Recording. Service, yes. On records. So that's yeah. how you started watching the show. Uh, well, like I said, I had seen I had seen the episode uh, of the of August sixteenth seventy seven where he reenacted, and then the second episode I saw was you and Billy finding the amulet. Oh, okay. You saw that one. Yeah, was that was the second. And so I was looking forward to meeting him, and uh, he was very nice to me. Very knowledgeable of music. He was he was he made real feelings. Uh, it was really just a, a surreal moment because it's nine o'clock on a Sunday night. Nothing's going on. I'm standing in the doorway looking at where it all started, looking at the spot in the floor that Elvis. I mean, it's like it, it would be like maybe finding where the Ten Commandments were. I mean, or Noah's Ark. I mean, I know that sounds I'm not trying to sound disrespectful when I say that. But to me, that was huge. Yeah, uh, because of Elvis. Plus, you're there with a guy that knows so much of the story, and he's probably knows more than any tour guide there at the Sun Records. <laughs> you know that could tell you anything. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because I'm Billy, sure he took you to the back. I'm sure he probably took you to the back to the uh, some photos of them in the booth. Uh, actually, actually, he and I went down into the basement. I was going to oh. say, now that's never made it on a video, but we've been down in the basement. Yeah, oh, the basement, really. Yeah. yeah. What's the basement like at? Those it's not very big. No. But, but can you imagine? There. Can you imagine what happened down there, Billy? There ain't no telling. Well, and it was uh, it was two uh, recording engineers, a, a guy and a girl, and they basically just told us, "You guys have got free run of the place. Go to the restaurant, do whatever you want to do." So there was lots of. They were there. We were there probably four hours or more, and I wasn't playing music or recording, so I got to walk around a lot and just. Uh, just take it all in and look at a picture on the wall of Johnny Cash and Elvis and, and look and go, my gosh, I'm standing right where this happened at. Yeah, yeah this is where uh, it happened at. Billy, it was, I, I, I saw something I wanted to ask you about. I saw where somebody took a picture of supposedly a where Bill Black's base used to be. And I'm I'm kind of like, oh, I don't know about all this. What do you, you know? It's like it, it's where made it would like, sit in there. Yes. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I did. He play there enough for something like that to happen, where he left a big mark in the floor. Uh no, no, absolutely exactly. not. So if they're if they're saying that, that's that exactly. can't be factual. Now I'll tell you something. This is a little aside, and I cannot believe I cannot find this photo. I'm so sorry, y'all. I'm trying. Um, but the uh. You, if I wasn't, I'm trying to be on screen and let y'all talk, and this is just not going well. So yeah. I can't find it. But anyway, we'll I'm sorry. 
so anyway, I had a mullet and I actually had hair back then. And um, <laughs> so anyway, the uh, the thing that I learned is this. I did a story about Elvis going and auditioning at Scotty's apartment on Bells. That's a true story. In the video, I said that uh, the bass that Bill Black, Bill would leave his bass at Scotty's apartment because Bill had little kids and they didn't have room at their apartment. So it was stay at Scotty's house in the living room. And in the video, I said that um, that that bass ended up in the hands of Paul McCartney. That is not true. The original, and somebody pointed this out to me. So this is an example of Wickwam. But we want to, uh, and this is an example of me not knowing any better and saying something in a video that I thought was factual and it wasn't. So that's not a, a perfect example of Wickwam. But anyway... It turns out that the original bass that Bill played in the very beginning, when they did the very first Sun recordings, the very first couple, was a different bass than the one that Paul McCartney. If you go back and look at the pictures, it's a different, the, the structure of it is different. Nobody knows where that bass is at, by the way. And so really? there's a bass that Bill Black used in the very first stuff that's out there because nobody would throw a, an instrument away. So it's somewhere. So someone has that bass that Bill Black used in the original, and there's photos of it. It's out there. So mm -hmm. that would be a great thing to find. And uh, but someone pointed that out, and that's the thing that I love about doing videos. And we let me let me go back to that. Um, boy, our time is almost up. This is it's happened so fast. So the thing that I find interesting is, you know, we've talked about playing music. I recorded a lot of times with a lot of different groups and I never recorded anything that I went, yep, that that's it. That works for me. Can't do that better. So I've never gotten any real fulfillment, if you will, out of recording music. I have, however, gotten fulfillment out of making videos. So there's something about the, the making videos, doing the visual and the audio that I can finish something and go, yep, that's what I wanted. And so I have found that I am not or never was meant to be a recording artist. That's not my gift. Uh, I, I, and not to say that I'm good at making video. I'm not saying this in a bragging way. I'm just saying that I get fulfillment from making videos. I never got fulfillment from making uh, uh, recording songs. Never. Gotcha. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, so, it, it, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, we were going to talk about a couple of different things. You went on the bus tour with us, of course, and yes. we've talked about that a little bit. But we had the uh, uh, the the fun of going with someone very famous, Hank Snow's son, uh, Jimmy Snow. And if you've watched the Elvis movie, Jimmy's in the movie. We were able to go with Jimmy Snow over to our friend Larry Moss's museum. And there's some surreal moments that happened there. So tell us about that. Man, I, I, I teared up, man. I did. It was like, because we went into the museum and could, could you, told, you invited me, right? Yes. You just said, hey, you want to go, you know, you should go, whatever. And Jimmy Snow Rogers was such a great, personable, loving guy. I mean, he would just, you felt like he was part of your family. When I walked up to him, he said, you remind me of my uncle. He was either Uncle Buck or Uncle Butch. He said, you look exactly like him. He said, it's the weirdest thing. So we had that connection the rest of the night. You know, he just, just what a wonderful guy he was. But to go over, go to the museum there and open the doors and see Elvis's jumpsuit. And I just saw JFK's rocking chair, Marilyn Monroe's wedding ring, Clark Gable's boot, John Wayne's eye patch. I mean, the, uh, the Bruce I mean, just... Uh, I couldn't take it all in. And then on top of that, uh, Larry and his wife were just so welcoming to us. You know, I mean, they come look at our museum, cook at our stuff, everything. Great, great people. I love that. It was it was wonderful. And the part that, that really, and Trey, of course, he doesn't meet a stranger, right? He's in there mixing it up and everything. But the part that really, really was weird was uh, uh, Jimmy Snow Rogers was sitting down and Mr. Moss, Larry, was standing over him. And he was telling Larry the story about how the contract was signed with Elvis and Vernon and, you know, all that happened and all that. And Larry says, well, I got the contract. You want to see it? 
He's like, what are you talking about? He goes, yeah, I got the original contract. You want to see it? He's like, I would love to see that. And so it was just one of those, that was one of those Bigfoot meets Loch Ness monster moments. It's like, this is not supposed to happen in real life, you know? And it was just like, wow. And uh, if I live to be 100, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that experience at night. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Trey, for inviting me along to be a part of that. Um, it was Larry's just, collection is unbelievable. He's got stuff there. You know, we were just talking about Bill Black's double bass that that would have been at Scotty's house and in those first recordings. Well, Scotty's guitar that was at the house that day that was in all of the recordings, Larry has. That you played. You played yeah. that guitar. Yeah, it's there in the collection. He has that guitar. He's got the – that's a ES-295 uh, gold top uh, Gibson that belonged to Scotty. And Scotty – Confirm that it's that it's at, and you saw that Scotty autographed the guitars. And yep. I think Larry now has, is it 13 or 14 Elvis related string instruments? He's got yeah. Bill Black's first electric bass. You know, they had to move him to electric bass because they started playing such large venues that the double bass they couldn't it wouldn't they couldn't pick it up anymore. So when he moved to electric bass, Bill uh, uh, Larry has that bass. He also has the bass he, that he has to follow that dream. The follow that dream guitar, guitar. That that's has right. That he played movie. on the on the thing. He has yeah. the uh, one from Viva Las Vegas where he falls in the pool with Ann Margaret. He's got that guitar. And, and Elvis signed that, that one. Elvis signed that guitar. Yep. The, the one he's got the bass that Elvis is sitting on the couch. If you've ever seen that video where he's or the picture where Elvis is sitting on the long white couch in the living yes. room, he's got that 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 cream colored bass. He's got that bass. He's got the very first bass that was ever played on national TV. That was, wow. um, it was uh, Johnny Cash's bass player's bass. Um, he's got that bass guitar. Um, uh, Baby, you're so square. That song that Elvis played the bass in, he yeah, got that one, right? He's got that bass, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then you saw, you saw the jailhouse rock suit. I, I touched the jailhouse rock suit. I wasn't yes, supposed to. He lets you touch it. But I, the right sleeve right here. So every time I see those iconic pictures of Elvis doing the job, I know that I touched that yeah. little piece. I get you talking about it, guys. Hey, Rob, I, I've seen two collections of Elvis memorabilia. Larry's definitely the ultimate one. And I put Larry's. I, to me, I hanging out Larry, with Larry and seeing Larry that, much. it rivals Graceland, man. I'm, t I'm just telling you, like, oh, yes. Yeah. The oh. stuff that he has, that he he has my favorite thing. He has the homecoming September 26, 1956 shirt Elvis wore in Tupelo, Mississippi. The dark wow. blue one. The dark blue one, that famous one in those cool, iconic 56 pictures of Elvis. Larry has that. <laughs> and Anita Wood had that made for Elvis. Who do? Anita Wood. Anita oh, Wood. Wow. I mean, Natalie Wood. Natalie Wood. Natalie. Yeah, Natalie. And Anita, uh, yeah. what you talking about? I keep getting Anita and Natalie. Anita's his girl. But uh, yeah, man, man. So we got three minutes left, guys. Yeah. Um, another himself. thing that he had there was, you know, you mentioned the contract. He also has the original contract to the Audubon House signed by Vernon and Gladys and Elvis and the original contract to Graceland. Yeah, the original title paperwork and all that. And he's, he's got, got that crazy stuff. He's got that little old junky acoustic guitar from Tupelo Hardware. Yeah, he's got Elvis's very first guitar. Guys, that Elvis yeah. gave to Red that yeah. ended up with Red in college there in Mississippi that Red yeah. gives to one of his football teammates one night because he had too much stuff in his car and his teammate kept it all these years. Yep. And then it got back. That's how that that guitar was found. He's got some amazing stuff. He has uh, uh, another one of, the guitars he has. It's one of them that he threw to Charlie and Charlie missed and it hit the floor and it busted the back of it. That's a, it's a Gibson. It is a, uh, it's not the Dove. It's a, now I'm not going to be able to think of what it is, but it's a kind of a, 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 a sunburst guitar. It's reddish colored acoustic. He's got that one. He has that cool shirt that Elvis wore, that white shirt with an EP and, and cursive. And yes. Yeah. And the, yeah. the red, the red shirt from the, the jailhouse rock 45 cover. Yes. The red jacket. The red jacket. Red jacket. Yeah. Yes, the jacket. Lansky Brothers. Yes. Another thing he has is the, I've got pictures of it. The Aloha from Hawaii uh, horseshoe ring. Hey, we wore that, didn't we? Do it? Yeah, yeah. And, and to tell you how skinny Elvis's fingers were, it would only fit on my pinky. 
Nine and three quarter. Yeah. Hey, Billy, yep. Billy, tell Rob, tell Rob I made it happen, though. Tell, tell he him did. what I did. He was, he would go, well, now, Larry, you know, you got to, we got to, we got to wear them. <laughs> Well, we okay, so on. listen to this, that, Rob. Right. So listen to this, Rob. Larry put the ring on me, right? Right. And I said, man, I said, Larry, I know you got Elvis' sunglasses. <laughs> oh, I didn't turn around. I didn't turn around. He put <laughs> he the sunglasses on me. So now I'm wearing that Aloha ring. I got Elvis's TCB sunglasses on there. And I said, Larry, you got a necklace, don't you? Go you ahead, Larry. Small tray. I got to see that necklace. He put the necklace around me. I didn't even know how to put the necklace on because I, I Elvis's necklace doesn't have a, a there's a, no clasp on it. A clasp. So I learned something. And it he put that. So I'm wearing the TCB sunglasses. I'm wearing his TCB necklace. And I got that Aloha ring. And I said, you know what? It don't get no better than this. Yeah, no better than that. Happened, Rob. Here's what happened. The spa guy got to do the same thing. And then our old friend that I'm not going to mention got to do the same thing. So I, I made her happy that day, too. Man, that's great, guys. That's wow. Heart palpitate. Look, here, I'm wearing a, I'm wearing a thing here. My heart rate is 105 right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you should have been exciting. Our yeah. heart rate that day. We I remember Billy and I left and we were just like, Trey, nothing's going to top that. Right. I put on some glasses just like these. Hey, I like that. Really Elvis's. Man, I love that. Yeah, I love you're those. Your profile picture, Billy. Don't you still have the profile pitch, I picture? I sure do. On your Facebook, so oh, man, I'm Facebook not having look, look, bringing pictures up, Trey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Billy's got, you go to his Facebook page, and you'll see the uh, picture yeah, of him wearing the ring, Facebook the necklace, page. and the sunglasses. Well, guys, we are over. Rob, thank you so much, my friend. We'll do this again <laughs> real soon. Thank Trey, you, guys. Thank you. And I don't know how this ended up being about uh, me playing music, but. Uh, it, you know, we just turn the camera on and go. Yes. Yeah, we'll get Rob like back on and ask him about what he thought about our stuff, you know. Yes. Yeah, we'll have to yes. do that again. Yeah. Guys. Awesome, guys. Thank y'all so much. Let's Thank y'all so much. Well, the trip, it was a privilege, gentlemen. The privilege it was all mine. It's a privilege having you on, Rob. I appreciate Thank you, guys. my friend. Love Thank you, brother. Yes, Love you guys, too, man. Take care, y'all. Bye. Right. Right, sir.